Well, thank you very much, and I appreciate the attendance of everyone who's uh, listening in on this <coughs> whirlwind tour, a 30-minute snapshot of everything that you're supposed to do to develop uh, analytical and stability studies for biotech products, whether it's an original product or a biosimilar product. And I will tell you that when they gave me 30 minutes, it takes me 30 minutes to say hello properly. So I apologize. This is going to be very fast. Uh, and um, uh, But hopefully we'll give you a flavor of the kind of things that I cover when we uh, have, when I do present the class. It's uh, I've got two different classes. One is an overview and one is a drill down. And I'll point out to you um, as we go through these slides which of the things would be in which class. So, you know, why, why is it that we have so many different challenging elements for our CMC side, our quality module side for biotech products relative to chemical products? And it's pretty simple. This is our drug factory. We have a cell that has got all of its own machinery to be able to survive, plus whatever piece of machinery that we've introduced to be able to make the product that we're trying to target. And so fundamentally, from the very beginning, we have a very different scenario when it comes to developing a pharmaceutical product. And so we have processes that are very complex upstream, and we use relatively uh, delicate downstream purification processes, delicate in the sense that if we're too harsh, we can denature the material that we're trying to recover, and structure often is related to function. So we have to be very careful about how we sort these things out. And it means that in the bottom, by the time we get to the purified drug substance, relative to a chemical product, it's not very pure at all. And even if it is pure, meaning doesn't have much in the way of process residuals, it still has a lot of heterogeneity because the, the, the nature of our, our materials are that they can be heterogeneous. Isoforms, glycosylation states, are critical to the nature of the products and are normal, but they do represent a degree of heterogeneity that has to be addressed. When we go into fill and finish, we have to be very careful because, again, we can't denature the material as a part of uh, get, making it sterile. So we have relatively gentle filtration steps. And then we go into a drug product where the material in the bottle is, is, is highly heterogeneous. And so the pressure is really high on the analytical side to be able to know what analytical methods to use to describe the heterogeneity. And then, of course, if you take this and add one more element now, which is that you've got to develop a biosimilar product that is comparably or similarly heterogeneous in the product-related substances to the original product and hopefully minimal in the process-related heterogeneity that would be unique to your own process. All of that comes from analytical uh, issues, analytical data, analytical methodology, which is as complex and as uh, uh, difficult and challenging as the process itself. So if you compare a chemical process to a biologically uh, derived process and all of these different elements, raw materials, the process the conditions, characteristics, analytical methods, um, you can see that we have a very different challenge, a, a di very different scientific challenge ahead of us, even though we have the same goal, which is to have a product that's in a bottle that is, uh, has the right quality attributes, um, has the right safety elements, and is shown to be efficacious on the day that we make it and the day that the last person gets the last bottle from the oldest batch. And so all of this comes from a set of regulatory guidance documents that describe the studies that we have to do to be able to achieve the data that can show regulators that we know what we're making and that we know that it's uh, pure and high quality and stable. But the other reason that we have pressure on us in the biotech world is because many chemical products, most of them in fact, have an oral dosage route that they can use. That's because the chemical active molecule is not destroyed by digestion. Studies that are done in development of these chemical products select molecules to be stable when it comes to the, the gut. Um, but if we use a protein product by the oral dosage route, what happens to a protein? It's meat. We digest it and we absorb it. So if you're trying to cure somebody's rheumatoid arthritis or if you're trying to target an anti-cancer uh, monoclonal antibody, it's not going to make it through the gut uh, with an oral dosage route. So we go perennially, um, which is wonderful for, for delivery of the molecules into the circulatory system, but that also means that we're delivering all impurities and we're delivering all contaminants. Uh, and as I mentioned, we have to be very gentle with these molecules. We can't terminally sterilize it with heat. We can't use high uh, uh, aseptic material, um, antiseptic materials because they can cause problems when they're injected. Um, also, we have challenges because with chemical products, uh, over time on stability, we tend to monitor their loss of efficacy because we're not concerned that the degradants could hurt you. That's been tested in 
that would have been tested in tox studies to show that any degradant products wouldn't be tox toxic to patients. But in biotech products, we care about loss of efficacy, but also increase in degradation. Because increased degradants can provide a safety risk faster than loss of potency. Uh, so we pay a great deal of attention to how our molecules degrade and what those degradants are. And the reason is because any change in impurities in a parenteral route means that we can have a problem with safety. And for degradants uh, and any protein-based impurities, we're dealing with the possibility of immunogenicity. And the body has an extremely long memory. Um, if you have something that's in the body uh, that, that, that can cause an immunogenic response, it can, it, that means that your body can be permanently sensitized to it which is wonderful if that's a vaccine and what it's being sensitized to are the potential invading organisms. But it's not wonderful if what the molecule is, uh, that sensitized your body was something endogenous like erythropoietin or growth hormone. So we have to be very mindful about all of these elements and safety uh, far more um, acutely than we are for, say, a chemical product. Because of all of this stuff, we have rules that have been established now that we do have an approach that is possible to be able to develop similar biological products, but it's not the same approach that we take for chemical generic products. And it's, it's almost entirely based upon an analytical exercise, utilizing the appropriate techniques and making the appropriate measurements to say, is our molecule in toto similar to the original molecule that has been shown to be safe and effective in clinic? And drawing that line, that analytical line, is an extremely challenging exercise for many technical reasons. Um, so let me go over the worldwide regulations. In the class, I go through uh, these in greater detail, but I just want to give you a snapshot of the kinds of information that come to bear that we as people who develop biotech products, people who are analytical scientists developing and supporting biotech biosimilar products, these are all the things we have to know. Um, it starts, um, I'm going to start with the US side of it. We have different levels of, of regulations. We have our Code of Federal Regulation, which is the law. These are the GMP requirements. These are the laws for GLP. These are things like Part 11 compliance for computerized systems in the process and then the analytical laboratory side. We also have a layer of guidance documents that are recommendations um, that are guidance for industries. These are not laws, but they can prevent you from getting your product approved um, or getting any changes approved to your product if you don't follow what they, what they recommend to the, to the, uh, to suit, suitably for the regulatory reviewers. And then in the US, we also have a set of documents we can look at, which are kind of look back uh, documents that tells inspectors and reviewers what to look for. So let's say that the law says thou shalt have um, validated analytical test methods and a safety profile of your product uh, for stability. Then the guidances will tell you how to develop analytical methods and validate them to the satisfaction of the regulatory reviewers. And it will tell you how to establish a stability profile um, to generate data on product uh, quality over time. And then the Compliance Policy Guidance Manual would tell them what to look for. Did they develop suitable methods which are in a state of control for intended use? Did they develop an appropriate stability profile using suitable analytical methods? And have they monitored the stability appropriately over time uh, at the target condition? And so these three uh, buckets, if you will, of documents represent sets of information that we have to consult to be able to know what the guidance, what, what we are supposed to be doing, at least in the US. On the European side, um, we have a number of guidance documents as well. The Udralex Volume 4 are the laws, and there are laws that are associated with GMPs for drug product, drug substance. There's a variety of, of general GMP documents. And on the European side, there's a number of annexes, which have a lot more granularity and information and requirements for production of products. This actually is a nice. Uh, and I, I like this, uh, this approach because it has more detail than what we have on the US side for our laws, but it does provide you information and you've got to know what each of these mean, what they say, and how they apply to you at whatever phase of development you're in for your product. Also, on the European side, there are many directives. Uh, many of them are legally enforceable. Uh, some of them are, are, are general guidance, but they're, they're the comparable how to do the things that the UDRILEX um, uh, requires you to do. On top of that, we have a slew of documents that are, that, that are coming from International Conference on Harmonization, um, many of which uh, are, are key drivers, regardless of where your product is licensed, whether it's US, U, uh, European Union, Japan, K 
Canada, uh, Switzerland, which is not a member of the EU, and then Australia, and even in other countries, they often point to their uh, acceptance of an ICH approach for many of these things. So there's a, there's a set of documents related to product stability. This is for any product, not just uh, chemical products and to some degree biotech products. There are uh, there, the guidance document that's the prevailing international document for what we do for test methods is test method validation. Um, there's several on process and product related impurities, not all of which apply to biotech products. Some do, some don't. Um, there's pharmacopoeial harmonization sections on individual pharmacopoeial methods uh, that can be applied to, to biotech products. Uh, again, there's not a lot of them that have been harmonized yet, but it's getting better. Test procedures and acceptance criteria. These two documents, actually, if you leave this call today and you only pick up one guidance document to look at, I recommend strongly that it be Q6B. Q6A is related to uh, chemical drugs. Q6B is related to biotech drugs. And there's a variety of others. I'm not going to go through them at this point because this is a 30-minute overview, but I want to just let you know that the class that I teach and the information that you're responsible for comes from all of these documents, plus one more that I'm going to show you a little bit more about since it's a really uh, wonderful overview document. In addition to that, there's a series of guidance documents from ICH that are specifically related to biotech products. There's five of them. I go into great detail in the class about 5C and 5E because those are analytically, uh, really analytically driven, stability and comparability. Um, on top of those, if that wasn't enough for you, there are, are guidance documents and directives that are related and relevant to specific types of biotechnology products, whether you derive them from plants or from plasma or gene therapy or cellular or vaccine, um, obviously the classic monoclonals and recombinant proteins, and of course the newest one, uh, some of the newest ones are biosimilars. And on biosimilar products, there's another set of guidance documents that are specifically applicable. 5E and 6B apply in the sense of the strategies, but, but what you're demonstrating is comparability, not biosimilarity, that's a different study, but the approaches that one takes, the features that you measure and the analytics that you use are drawn from the principles that are in 5E and 6B. There's also a number of regional guidance documents in the EU. That was the first uh, re regulatory authorities in the world that, that really launched the paradigm for, for um, CMC requirements for similar or biosimilar products uh, in many, many countries of the world, um, uh, not the U US necessarily, but many other countries of the world uh, base their principles on um, uh, they, they refer directly to the EU guidance documents. There's also regional, uh, a number of regional guidance documents that have come out from the US in the last year um, that all have extremely important information driving tremendous analytical strategy. And then there's a, there's a variety of documents that come from non-ICH uh, countries. And as I mentioned, they tend to follow the same principles um, as EU and, and also with ICH. Um, the main difference, by the way, among the regions, whether it's US or European or rest of the world, the main difference among the, the regional uh, considerations are on the nature of the pre and clinical studies, the CMC requirements um, for developing the product in general and for doing the biosimilarity study that's related to analytics are very, 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 very similar. Um, on, in terms of biosimilars, there's also emerging uh, monographs on biosimilar products, each of which has in the information related to the analytical uh, standards and the analytical specifications that are expected to be used. In the class, we go through all of these guidance documents that are related to original products as well as biosimilar products and how to use re reference standards appropriately, how to set them up for your own product, and then how to use international reference standards that have been established for individual products appropriately as a part of its control, uh, the product's control strategy and a part of the specification. So you can see there is just a massive amount of, of information already available um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the world that we must be aware of and mindful of and know uh, how it all fits together. Um, in the class that you're going to attend with me, I'm going to give every, every member gets a, a USB drive that inc includes every one of these guidance documents that I just mentioned, plus a bunch more. And throughout the two classes that I teach, we go and whenever I pull something from a guidance document, every slide contains the reference on it from the exact document that it comes from so that after the class, you can go back and find the information for yourself and uh, hopefully incorporate it into your thinking as you develop your strategies for your own products and your own processes. Um, there is one guidance document. The other guidance document, if, there, if there's a second guidance document that I would recommend strongly that you obtain and read after this overview, 
um, it is this one. It's the Common Technical Document. And it's got, uh, it came out in, in a couple of different uh, editions, um, some of which the last two, the updates that were Q&A, about 75% of the information in there is specifically analytically driven. About 25% are process clarifications, about 75% are clarifications that are related specifically to analytics um, as, as applied to the control strategy and as applied to the specifications and justification of specifications. And we go through that in the, in the classes. Um, I focus on module three, that's the quality section, which in, in some parts of the world we call CMC. And that section actually tells you exactly the information you have to generate to be able to get regulatory reviewers to first review and approve your product for a clinical trial, and then later to hopefully approve it for use for commercialization. And there, is a, there, there are two, the two sections of the module that we go through in, in, in fairly great detail in the classes include 3-2-S uh, drug substance. And you can see this is all of the sections. And under, under each of these, in the guidance itself, it tells you the kind of data. It doesn't tell you how to generate the data. It doesn't tell you necessarily when to generate the, the data. But it tells you that these are the data which must be generated. And I've got an asterisk here to indicate that if you have a conjugate product, meaning like a, a, an antibody drug conjugate or a pegylated protein, something where you've got a biological moiety that's been uh, attached to some drug moiety or, or maybe even another biologic, I've done a couple of biologic, biologic conjugates, um, you've got to have one of these drug substance sections that are filled out with data for each moiety, so one on the monoclonal, one on the drug, one on the linker if it's separate from the drug, and then another one on the monoclonal linker drug uh, combination, the antibody drug conjugate or the pegylated molecule. And then you have the next one, uh, the next one, which is drug product. And if you look at this, this, this set of, uh, this outline set, this set of seven sections, all of the ones that I've highlighted here in red have major components related to analytics. Uh, not just the obvious ones, not just characterization and control uh, or reference standards uh, or stability, but there's also critical analytical information in, in, uh, in process control, critical information in process development, that's the comparability studies that one would have done, and critical information from analytics that's in process validation or what today we call PPQ. Um, there are analytical methods used during that study which are only used during that study. And we go to, to, to great detail in the class for different types of products. What are the analytics that you use? How do you stage them? Um, when do you validate them? How do you qualify them? Um, and then what the data sets are that go into each of these sections. Uh, on the drug product side, there's eight sections that are, that are specified, and you've got to fill out all eight. Um, for whether, whether it's an innovator or a, a, by a similar product, you've got to fill out both the DS and the DP sections. And again, this is the red, the red highlights all the things where there are substantial contributions of analytics to the information that goes into these sections. And then in the regional sec in, in the, uh, the additional materials, additional information, we have appendices and we have regional information that goes uh, in, in, in the countries that you submit. And needless to say, these two, the method validation packages, which you have to physically submit for the US, and all of the similarity study that you do with analytics to compare your product, if it's a biosimilar, to one or more reference licensed products goes in the regional information. That's a very large, analytical, entirely analytical section. Uh, for physical methods and functional methods. So you can see that if this is the data set that we have to give to regulatory bodies, it's a massive section, it's an amount of information. And we haven't even talked about the individual analytical, analytical tools yet. Um, from those studies, there are 10 required data packages. And in the, in the advanced class, I go through how to develop each of these data packages. The physiochemical profile of the product, establishing and continuing with reference materials, qualifying and then validating appropriate test methods, um, how, to, how to generate data for lot release testing, and how to mine the data for information about method performance, not so much product quality, but about method performance. Um, uh, we, we touch on the, the studies for formulation screening. We, go, we spend a great deal of time on the studies, the detail of the study design to do degradation evaluation, which is important not just for assessing the product and the methods, but it also factors heavily in the comparison that you have to do for biosimilars to uh, reference licensed drugs. Obviously, there's a, a lot of stability data that's going to be collected. Um, there now has to be extractable leachable studies in the class. I think it's the advanced class. I give you a bit of an update on what uh, the approaches are that are expected for biotech products for ENL studies. And then we talk a great deal about comparability assessment, um, meaning that this is, this is changing from process A to process B 
of one drug, whether it's an innovator drug or if it's a biosimilar drug, if you make process changes, you have to do these comparability assessments. Every product has to do these 10, but originators can stop there. The 11th study is the study that is unique to people who develop biosimilars, and that is the biosimilar comparison study to the reference biotech drug. And that study actually has to be done not at the end, but at the beginning of the cycle, as I'll show you in just a minute. And that's that we talk about that study in great detail in the advanced class. Um, we talk a lot in a class about the analytical toolkit, uh, the largest toolkit that we have or methods that we use for characterization, comparability, and biosimilarity. Um, we talk about what are the current expectations for a wide class of products. What's the toolkit look like for antibodies? What does it look like for recombinant proteins that are not antibodies? What does it look like for gene therapy products? What does it look like for uh, uh, vaccine products? From those toolkits, we will derive methods that we will ultimately validate for drug substance and drug product release for quality control. And we talk about what is, where do you validate? When do you validate? How do you validate these methods? There's a new FDA guidance document that was just finalized in July of 2015. We go into it in great detail about what it means uh, in terms of the, how you approach the validation. Uh, also, what kind of data packages are now expected with the validation packages that you submit with your BLA um, in the US. And it's, uh, it's a lot more information in the package than what we used to have to uh, submit. Uh, and then also from those, we derive a subset of methods that are used for establishing the product stability profile uh, and for monitoring the product stability over time. We talk about this in great detail because my experience is the, ability, the, the, the way that one approaches this strategically and how one uh, uh, conducts the study is a major gap. I've worked on many, many, many products over many, many years, and just about every single one I've ever worked on has had significant gaps in how they do the uh, analytical approach to this. And in the most recent, say, two or three years, regulatory bodies uh, around the world, particularly in the US, have been really finding these gaps and requiring them to be remediated before approval of the product. And so we, we try to get up on those in the class. Uh, in the advanced class, we go into detail on how to do it in the introductory class. We talk about why it's necessary and some of the basic principles. We talk in the classes about uh, the fact that biotech specifications come from four different criteria. Uh, capabilities manufacturing, we don't discuss because that's a process question, but the stability of the bulk and final product, the nature of the batches used in the clinical studies, and absolutely the capabilities of the analytical methods. Because without understanding the analytics, both the selection of tools and the performance of the methods that you've chosen, Without knowing those things, you can't possibly define the capabilities of the process, the stability of the material, or know what's in the material that was in the clinical studies. Because we are definitely allowed to have heterogeneous products for biotechs, and that's, that's, a, that's, that's a basic principle in 6B. But the critical issue is that we have to define the pattern of heterogeneity and de determine that it's consistent with batches that we have safety and efficacy studies on. And so if we have batches of material that contain this amount of complexity, that's perfectly acceptable so long as we have sufficient analytical tools to describe and measure that complexity. We have to have tools in the toolkit that measure blue things and red things and pink things and yellow things and white things and green things. And we have to know what we don't know about what those tools measure. For example, hosting assays, which we talk about in some great detail, um, in both classes because they are another major gap uh, area that people have. Um, we don't know the host cell proteins that we're not measuring. And recently there have been publications on adverse events related to host cell proteins that were undetected um, because of deficiencies in the method early in development. And so we'll talk about how to remediate that deficiency and how to, how to be able to understand the risks for that most complex of complex um, uh, heterogeneities that we deal with. We also talk a little bit about how to stage the studies because I can tell you what to do and how to do it, but you're going to also want to know when to do things. And so this is an ideal scenario um, of, of those 10 uh, studies or 11 studies that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, if one was to say that the orange line is your first in human and the green line is your commercialization, then this is roughly how those analytical studies shake out. Um, not necessarily by practice from everyone, but that's what the guidance documents would say all the guidances I just told you about, if you pulled all the data out, of all the uh, requirements out of there, this is kind of how it looks. And until recently in our history for biotech, we were very happy 
as CMC people because the clinical study timelines were so much bigger than the CMC timelines that we were never on the critical path. Um, my experience over the you know 25 years of working on hundreds of products, generally if the CMC was a gating item for the for the final approval of the pro final licensure of, uh, package, the, the 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 lagging end was usually the stability data from the last few lots that had to be in before you could file your your application. Um, but other than that, the clinical study timelines generally were so big and so long uh, and sometimes so unpredictable that with CMC we had the luxury, the relative luxury, of being able to make mistakes in our strategies and recover from them if we if we if we had to. But that's a different. There's a different world today. We now have a world where we have biosimilar products. We also now have a world where we have breakthrough products. And both of those new approaches really put pressure on the CMC. Um, as I mentioned earlier, every regional requirement that I've read so far for biosimilar products. The differences are on how much non-clinical data you have to have before you're allowed to go in humans uh, and how much clinical data you're required to have to compare to the reference drug, and then you get approval for commercialization. But in, but in every region I've seen, there's no difference in the CMC requirements. You have to do exactly those studies I showed you. Um, and then on top of that, if you're a biosimilar, you've got to do the studies that compare you to the reference biotech product um, in order to be able to proceed forward. So if, if the clinical requirements are shortened, but the CMC quality requirements are the same, it means that we CMC people are now often the critical path. Um, and on top of that, the, the old paradigm of a reference product or the, what, what the innovator did, they generally had a modest amount of CMC before going to first in humans. They had increasing amounts of analytical CMC as they proceeded through development, and then by the time they got to licensure, they were able to then derive their control strategies um, that would be a subset of that. But for, for, for similar biotech products or biosimilars, it's an entirely inverted situation. You've got a, a huge amount of analytics to do before you're even allowed to get first in human. Then you have an increasing amount on a very short scale where you're constantly comparing to the reference product. And at that point, you're allowed to get your, your, your derive your commercial control strategy. So biosimilars have to front load all the analytics that means you've got, as a biosimilar product, doing a great deal more complex analytical studies much earlier than originators. And in the class that, we, that, that I go through, I show you this. And in the advanced class, I go into more detail about how to structure those studies. But that also means that if you're dealing with a situation where you've got abbreviated clinical, that you're now, and, and you've got to add the, the, the analytical similarity studies for biosimilars, now you're squeezed. Now we become, CMC becomes the critical path for biosimilars. And for breakthrough products, which don't have to compare to any original drug, they are a, 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 you know, a, a new drug, a novel drug, they still have abbreviated clinical pathways. That means that the CMC is still squeezed. And so because of that, it puts a great deal of pressure on the CMC people. And so my last slide here, which is to talk about who has succeeded or who will succeed in developing and commercializing any biotech product, but specifically a biotech product like a biosimilar or a breakthrough, where you've got such pressure on CMC, my observations have been it's not luck. It's actually planning. It's knowing all of those documents that I showed you and how they relate to your particular product, particularly the module three quality section of the common technical document. How are you planning to fill that out? Because you have to. Somebody better know what, to go, what goes in those sections. Know how and when to do each of those analytical studies for the biotech products, plus how to do and when to do the ones for biosimilar products implement the appropriate proven technology for both the process side and from my side, the analytical side, for maximum utility and reliability of the data you're going to collect. There are cases where platform technologies for analytics are appropriate, but not always. You have to know where customized approaches are required and where platform technologies can be developed for many products coming from the same expression system. You also have to, have to be able to divide, or, or you should, design your project, project strategies so that you don't collect one piece of data that you don't need. You need to be very mindful of every piece of data that you're required to have, and you want to be able to design your strategic um, plan to leverage each piece of data for future studies. However, I will say, don't get locked into the past. I do work with a number of companies where the senior people, especially management that hasn't been at the bench in a while, may indicate that, you know, well, we didn't do this before, 
we, nobody's ever asked us to put this in our packages before, and I licensed products in, you know, 2010. Yeah, well, it's 2016, and a lot has changed. And do you know what the changes are? So, you know, good luck on submitting that package that you did in 2010, but I have a suspicion it's not going to cut the mustard anymore. Also, learn from the mistakes of others and adopt best practices. This is a huge part of what I personally build into my classes. I have been around a long enough time with a number of products and places around the world to, to, to have learned from the mistakes of others as well as the mistakes I have made to be able to share it with you and show you what the best practices are in the global biotech industry for all of these things that we're talking about, at least from my perspective of the analytics for these uh, products. I also, I also strongly recommend that the people who succeed are active. They participate in meetings and conferences. They read the guidance documents and white papers. They remain up to date um, on things that are happening. Uh, training classes like those that are produced by PTI, the reason I've been working with them for so long is because it provides people with an update. So at the moment that you're there, you get a snapshot in time of what's going on and what's current. And the class I do today for PTI is very much evolved from the class I did, honestly, I think it was, I've been with them about 20 years, and my classes have evolved because the field has evolved. And if you don't have an instructor that's aware of the expectations today, then you're not going to be getting the information that you need from the time that you're spending. So in my, my, my last slide, my last point here is that success is not luck. It's careful informed planning and appropriate execution of the right studies the right way at the right time with minimal wasted effort and minimal wasted time. So with that, I will say thank you for your attention. I apologize for being, <laughs> being so quick. But this is what happens when you squeeze all of this in 30 minutes. It's like the CMC section. I've been squeezed uh, and have to be very careful on what I tell you guys. I have to apologize there for making you squeeze that all in. <laughs> and, that's okay. Um, that's, the, that's why I can do 32 hours on this <laughs> over four days. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nadine. So if anyone's got any questions, um, we can um, – I'll just have a look now if there is any – um, please, please write them in the question tab, and um, I'll put them to Nadine now. I know it's an overwhelming amount of information. Believe me, I lived through the development of most of these guidance documents, so I was able to digest them in small pieces over the course of 25 years. On the other hand, if you're starting now, they get you, you get to see them all at one time, which can be very much overwhelming. Which is why um, I, I, I put the class together to be able to do two days of an overview um, and an orientation and and showing you, you know, where these things fit and what they say, and then two days of the nuts and bolts wet chemistry side of it to say, okay, now you know what you're supposed to do and when you're supposed to do it, let's talk about how. Um, because otherwise it's just impossible to try to even wrap your head around some of this stuff. Plus we have a lot of fun in the class. I tell a lot of war stories that uh, uh, often people recognize the similar similar scenarios. I think it's kind of good to realize that the things that you're seeing aren't unique necessarily, that uh, people have made the same mistakes before and survived. Cool. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, someone's asked what um, what have been the most common items in comparability protocols pre-approved changes? Oh, you mean like for, for, for if, if you make a, there, there is an opportunity um, to be able to generate a, a, a comparability protocol plan that you can, you can commit to the regulatory bodies that if you make these changes in the process of the product and you use these analytical approaches and you get these data that, um, that, that you can make the changes without any, with, with a lower regulatory burden. I'll tell you the truth, prospective comparability plan meaning that you're going to try to get approval for all future changes. People have not had a huge amount of success with that in my experiences. Uh, comparability plans that you, that you generate at the moment you're making the change, though, have been incredibly successful. I mean, that is that has been a major hallmark of, of improvement in biotech. We didn't used to even have the ability to do an analytical comparability study. Uh, now we do. And the biggest gaps that I see in some of those that are executed are that they don't design the study it correctly. They don't the, the sample preparation, the things you're comparing, this is true whether it's comparing the process, you know, process A and process B, or whether you're taking materials from a reference product and a biosimilar product. After you've chosen the correct analytics, the most challenging thing is how do you actually physically conduct that analysis? Because slight differences in formulation, slight differences in concentration, even for the same process, slight differences in the material from process A to process B can have an impact on how you do the measurement. And so the, really the most challenging thing is, is designing the studies 
correctly with the sample preparations being considered. Brilliant. Um, someone said here, do wrong courses to explain CMC to non-CMC experts? Yes, I can do a course that explains CMC to non-CMC experts. Actually, the very first part of the module, the, 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 the first part of the first day of the intro class, that module is all about uh, it's, it's the regulations and how they fit together and explaining, uh, showing where in the, the CMC sections that we have to provide certain data. And many times I've been asked to give that module, which is about two and a half hours, to senior management. <clears throat> because senior management people who are obviously controlling the resources and the timelines for the scientists doing the work, they really don't have any idea sometimes how you know, what, what's expected and why these people are saying I need more people and more time. So that first part of the first day, I have very frequently been asked to repeat it for uh, either a webinar or something else for upper management because they're non-CMC people, but it shows them what the CMC must, you know, what you're obligated to, to do. And we haven't got to go into when things are done or how to do them, but they need to know what's required. And most importantly, where it's written, because none of us are making this stuff up. You know, I can, I, the, the slides I showed you at the beginning today, every one of those contains required things that we do. So we're not making up the fact that we have to do these things. We just need to show them where it's written. Brilliant. I don't think there's any more, um, any more questions, Nadine. So um, All right. I'll end it there. So thank you very much for your time. And thank you everyone thank for you joining. Thank you, guys. All right. And whether you take a class or not, if you see me at a meeting, be sure to come up and say hi. <laughs> thank you very much. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye, Nadine.